Welcome to the Really Know Your Customer podcast with your hosts, Betsy Westhafer and Tony Bodo. Join Betsy and Tony as they dive in with highly successful C-suite leaders who have grown successful organizations by creating a laser focus on listening to their customers and building deep customer relationships. Now, it's time to join Betsy and Tony for the Really Know Your Customer show. Welcome to the Really Know Your Customer podcast. I am Tony Bodo, CEO of Tony Bodo International. Hi, Tony. Hey, welcome, everybody. I'm Betsy Westhafer, CEO of the Congruity Group. And together, we are the co-authors of Profitability, the revealing story of why companies succeed, fail, or bounce back. And I probably butchered the subtitle there, Betsy. I nope, you got it just right, Tony. You got it <laughs> okay. just right. Um, and I'm so excited because today's, today's podcast, today's episode is really, truly amazing. We have Leslie Bilby, and she is the Chief Strategy Officer and Co-CEO of Demosmo Goldstein, or DIGO, D-I-G-O. And Digo is an advertising agency and brand agency out of New York. And they are an amazing company. I have had great pleasure of working with them in various projects for the past three years. And have really gotten to know Leslie over the past couple of months. Um, she's just a joy to work with. And she is a brilliant, brilliant person um, in the advertising industry, but also from a perspective of understanding and really knowing your customer. I honestly... I've learned so much from her and I've been in this in this space for what 15 years now something like that and just just listening to her in meetings and how she thinks has been phenomenal. So you're going to pick that up in this podcast this episode here today. The the one thing I want you to really listen for is how she thinks about the customer journey. We talk about customer journey and customer experience world all the time, but we talk about it most of the time from the perspective of the company looking in how does the customer use our product or service? How do they engage with us? When Leslie looks at it, she steps back and says, show me the life of the customer. Show me culture as a whole. Let me understand the big picture. And then she looks at where the company fits in and what they need to do on those moments in the journey that really matter. So we're going to hear a lot about that. I really want you to listen for that. Yeah, Tony, her perspective, and this was honestly the first time I had met her. I know you had had a chance to work with her, but as, as somebody just meeting her, I was just blown away absolutely by her brilliance, but also her vast experiences. She's lived all over the world. And what she really brings that I think is fascinating is that she got trained in psychology, um, professionally trained in psychology as well. So she brings that to the table as well. And and then finally, just, you know, she's been in this agency world for the vast part of her career, and she's been in a lot of different places and has such great perspective. And I just found her to be a fascinating woman, and I, was, I just felt honored to have her on the show. So with that, we will get started and introduce you to Leslie Bilby from Damasmo Goldstein. So Leslie, thank you for being here. We're so excited. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, so Leslie, as, as we told our listeners in the intro, you have this, this really good career, but we'd love to hear from you just kind of starting kind of at the beginning where it makes sense. Kind of walk us through your journey. I know you've worked in lots of different places um, around the world. Just kind of tell us where you started and how you landed um, at Digo. Yeah, so, um, so I've had a 30-year career so far that's been split into fairly even thirds. The first third was in London. Um, the second third was in pretty much Boston. I'm sorry, New York. And then the last third has been New York. And Boston and New York were kind of interchangeable, which is why I mix them up sometimes, because there were times when I commuted to New York from Boston um, as well. Um, and so essentially, I started my career. I stumbled into an agency called Collet Dixon Pearson Partners when I was in my early to mid 20s. Um, I'd left university, I'd gone to Paris for a couple of years um, to teach English, and then I came back, did a postgrad, didn't know what to do, did a temp job, ended up at CDP, got very lucky, and they agreed to put me on their graduate training scheme, and then I started out in new business, then I went into traffic for a year, and then ultimately I moved into account planning. Um, and then a few agencies in London, I'm originally from Scotland, but the industry is very small up there, it certainly was back then. 
Um, and then I got the call from uh, a headhunter about a job at McKinney and Silver when I just had my first two children. And so we decided, why not? Could be a good adventure for a couple of years. Went over to McKinney to work on Audi of America. Um, two years turned into three, turned into four. Um, you know, McKinney was fantastic. Um, but I think at that time we were maybe a little bit young for Raleigh. I could do it now, but, you know, back then. Um, felt that we wanted to get to the big city again, so we moved to New York. And then I worked for agencies like Merkley, um, and then ultimately into Hill Holiday. And then I started <laughs> going from Hill Holiday to Damasimo Goldstein. So Damasimo Goldstein, I've actually worked with Digo three times. This is my third time. Um, I worked with them for a couple of years, then another couple of years, and then I went away for five years and then came back very recently as co-CEO and chief strategy officer. So that is a very short version of my career to date. <laughs> so Leslie, tell us what, what about this world that you play in is so attractive to you personally and professionally? Yeah. Do you mean the world of advertising or the world of Digo or both? Uh, both. Both yeah. like I, it's very interesting that you've come back three times to Digo. So yeah, both. Yeah, so you know, advertising is one of those industries that you you know it's been evolving so quickly that at any time in my career, and typically every seven or eight years, you know, I had the pang of should I be doing something else? Should I go client side? Should I go for not for profit? Should I be going to another country? I mean, all these questions have rattled around in my head, and. Um, Every time I get there, something seems to happen to keep me pulled back in again. And so, for example, obviously, years and years ago, it was digital, then it was social, now it's data. And now we're moving into AI and, you know, and all sorts of interesting, you know, innovations that just keep it fascinating and interesting. Um, and I'm at a point now in my career where, you know, I want to state Deagle, I, th I think, until, you know, well, certainly for, for many years to come. And leading an agency at this point in my career, I think, is the right thing. And, you know, letting others move into the, the strategy role that I've occupied for quite a long time, I think, is the right thing to do as well. But, yeah, the industry keeps me fascinated. It's just um, it's just evolving so quickly. Um, in terms of Digo, you know, the fact that I've, I'm a three times boomeranger, I've done that in other agencies. I was at Mertley twice and I was at Hill twice. You know, when I work with people that I love to work with, I stay close to them and, and, and I hope that they would be happy to work with me again at some time in the future. And that's what happened with Digo as well. I'd known Mark and Lee for well over a decade. I'd kept, you know, close eye on, on them and how the, the agency had evolved. It's an exciting place. It's independent. It's smaller. Um, you know, they're not afraid to take risks. There's no holding company above them. Um you know, this new space that the agencies moved into was particularly fascinating to me and probably one of the main reasons why I wanted to go back this time, not just in the co-CEO role, um, but also because the agency is now all about positive behavior change. And that's not just a set of words. I've worked in many agency repositionings where the agency doesn't necessarily live by those words, uh, the words that are chosen by the team. But in this case, I can tell you that they truly are living by this, um, by this kind of ethos or, or creed or whatever you want to call it, because it's something that the agency has been doing for years and excelled at for years. But the decision was made fairly recently to, to really 100 percent focus on that now. So what that means is working with clients to help them help their customers or consumers do the things that they know they should be doing, but for whatever reason, they're hard for them to do. So it could be anything from taking your meds to not taking meds that are bad for you, to using less plastic, to drinking more water, to exercising more, to not cutting your pills, but figuring out a way to help you afford your pills. It can expand into many different areas. And it's all about helping consumers do things for the better that are ultimately going to help a client's business. So that's what we're focusing on. And that was appealing to me. Um, it's also been very appealing to a lot of the people that have just joined us. Uh, it's making the, the agency extremely attractive to the next generations of, of, um, of planners and account people and creatives, which is fast, fantastic to witness. So I, I agree. I think it's it's um, really interesting, that approach and, and quite different. So tell us how that plays out in in practice and how you work with your customers and the problem you're helping them solve and just kind of walk us through what that looks like in terms of a client engagement. Yeah, so Deco has had a natural affinity towards those kinds of clients uh, in the past. 
And again, this has become the, the sole focus now. Um, and so the clients that we're working with right now, it's kind of interesting to be in a position where you can choose the kind of clients that you want to work with. And so there are some clients that have come our way that we're desperate to work with. And then we look at the, the business and say, well, are they really the kind of client that wants to, to create positive behavior change? And if they're not, we pass. It's hard to pass, especially at the moment with our industry, you know, being tight. But pass we will, because if you're going to stand by something, you have to stand by it with conviction. So the kind of clients that we're attracting are those that are in the mental health space, that those that are in the, the kind of the exercise space or the eat healthier space. We've just taken on a couple of clients that are in the healthcare device space where they've created devices that help people just with their health in general. So the way that we work with those clients is there's a few tools that we use. The one that is probably most important is the customer journey, which is at the heart of the process that we use that we call the 3Ms process. So the 3M strategic process is essentially, you know, understanding it's, it's the first time is motivation. So what's the trigger? What is the thing that makes that individual feel that they have to change? So did something happen to their health? Were they told by a doctor that they were overweight or unfit? Um, you know, is that person had a change in their financial situation? Um, you know, is that individual just trying to lead a healthier lifestyle? Is that individual having problems with drugs or alcohol? It could be any of those triggers. Um, so that's the motivation. And then what we do is we track, you know, the customer's journey. So how they make decisions once that trigger has happened. And that moves us into the second space, which is, is momentum. So how do they make decisions? How do they explore? How do they get information? How do they choose which brands or companies or services to align with? Is there a point along the journey where they fall away? Because sticking to things that are good for you is hard. The hardest part is keeping up the good habit. Um, how do we keep them moving along? And then ultimately, you know, the, the last part of the three M's is the moments that matter most, is identifying the moments along the journey where your brand matters or doesn't matter, where the category matters and where there are holes and gaps and how you can fill those gaps either with by doing more research to understand more about the gaps. And then most importantly, figuring out the best channel and the best message to fill that gap so that the consumer or customer is thinking about you the whole way. And so that in turn, not only informs strategy, it informs creative and informs media planning as well. And so it's become a really useful tool for our media partners because we can, you know, work with them on the journey and identify places that syndicated may not be able to identify just based on the collective work that we do. Um, and these journeys are very much informed either by the client's own research. Typically, it's going to be a combination of their research and then some proprietary research that we do together. Um, but that's the 3Ms process. Uh, that's the kind of the shortened version of it. The longer version, if we have a client that wants a complete repositioning and has more time to do it, is we're looking at culture. We're looking at um, other factors of consumer behavior. Um, you know, we're, we're doing more thorough work around competitive analysis. But the journey, even then, is at the heart of the whole thing. Um, so there's a, there's a real process. There's a real science to it as well. What I've been impressed with, uh, you know, reading your book, Super Strategist, and really diving in and being able to work side by side with you for the last couple of months as we've uh, um, explored this is brand strategy more than, I've worked with a lot of really big brands, well-known brands. I don't think anyone of those brands ever thought about the customer journey pre-engagement, pre-purchase. Yeah, the way you think about it, and that is that has just blown my mind, and it made me reevaluate a lot of things that we do on the customer experience side of things. Because, and and what you just described is, it's really knowing your customer mm -hmm. or who you want to be your customer. Yeah, and, and I absolutely love that the depth of research you go into. So, talk to us a little bit more about what brand strategy is. I know that's your expertise and and a role you play, but. I think it's also so much more than that. It just, the, the way you go at it is so much deeper. So share a little bit more yeah. about that. Yeah, so brand planning is something that has many different names, um, but there's a reason why people of my age group have this accent because you know account planning, which is the original name, was invented in the UK by two agencies, by JWT and BMP, who both had two slightly different approaches. JWT's was more quantitative and BMP's was more qualitative. 
But essentially, the role was to represent the empty chair in the room, which is the consumer who was not being represented at all until that point. And so the account folks and creatives were making judgment calls just based on how they felt that day about the work and about the business. So having the consumer inform you but not make decisions for you became a really important part of what a planner did. Um, and then the planner worked and still works in close collaboration with account management and in particular with creative to make sure that the work stays on strategy and that the work is effective. Now, of course, over the last 30 years, as I mentioned at the very beginning of, of this discussion, everything's changed. So the days where we would do a piece of call and then write a brief, and then that brief would go into the creative vortex for six weeks and then get popped out the other end, hopefully with work that was on brief, 50% of the time, maybe not. And if the work was great, we just kind of changed the brief to match the work. Um, there was some success there, but there was also a lot of just kind of throwing stuff on the wall to see what stuck, to be perfectly honest with you. It wasn't particularly scientific. And now, you know, with the internet, with social, with all the other tools and, and data that's at our disposition, we can use so many of them to make sure that we are developing strategies and journeys and work with, you know, surgical accuracy. But the skill is to make sure that you don't forget the most important thing, which is the creative. Because the creative is something that typically cannot be quantified. It's not how the human brain works. And so... To me, the role of a brand planner or a brand strategist today is to kind of straddle those two worlds. It's how do you make sure that the creative is revolutionary and different and differentiated? And to be so, it has to be unlike anything that you've ever seen out there before. But at the same time, how do you help convince a client and yourself and your own team and do the right thing by putting it out there, safe in the knowledge that it is based on what you've learned, probably going to do really, really well. You can never be 100% sure, but you can at least be 70 or 80% sure. Um, and so doing that foundational work so that creatives can do their best work, to me, is the role of a modern, a modern account planner or brand planner today. Um, and the journey plays an important role there. The journey, by the way, Tony, I wanted to add, it's not just tracking how the customer navigates the category. There's a piece at the bottom that we call the emotional index, where we understand, you know, based on research, how the consumer feels on every stage. So obviously, if you're dealing with something as unbelievably emotional and sensitive, like mental health or drug addiction, um, they may start on an incredibly, incredibly low point. And as they start to learn more, you might discover that they start to feel a little bit better because there's a solution out there, or you might find that they just get unbelievably confused and there's a jagged part in the middle of the journey as their kind of their journey ebbs and their emotions ebb and flow along the journey. And then as they get to a point where they feel that a solution is definitely in place when they've made their decision and they've started doing the work, at that point, you might find that the emotion will start to go up if they have a good experience. And so pinpointing the emotional index to us is a really huge part of journey development as well. It's not just about rational left brain stuff. It's about the right brain stuff too. Leslie, I've got a question for you. As, as you shift from your focus throughout your career of being more of that strategist to now leading the company as co-CEO, how do you instill that positive behavior change into the culture at Digo? Yeah, so Marit, Lee and myself and the rest of the leadership, leadership team are working really hard on this. I mean, this is obviously a, a relatively new focus for us, um, but it hasn't been a, a new expertise, as I mentioned before, over the years. It's just become our, our sole focus. It's interesting. It's everything. So putting your, yourself through your own process is where it begins. It's developing your own journey. It's developing your own, you know, your own kind of, well, where's the gaps? At what point does the client coming in experience the notion of positive behavior change? It probably begins with your website. It begins with all of the content that you have out there. Um, you know, it's when they learn more about us. It's the cases that we put out there. It's the consultants knowing that that's our expertise. It's, um, you know, understanding our process. It's how we evolve our process to make sure it includes and, and is primarily focused on positive behavior change. It's the people that we recruit. It's the people that we train and how we train them. Everything has to go through that lens. And so, yeah, it's putting ourselves through our own rigorous process. And, uh, you know, as you know, the, the cobbler's children are always the worst shod, um, but we've made that a priority. Um, and so we started making changes to our website. There's much more to come. 
Mark has been actively, Mark Damasimo has been actively involved in creating content around this space because he's been a student of this space for many, many years. So we have more content that we know what to do with that we're pulsing out there, um, you know, and making sure that we're present in social and other channels. And, you know, and most importantly, it's not just making sure that our that the way that we put our face on out there is about positive behavior change. It's about living it every single day. It's about the leadership meeting that we had this morning where we ask ourselves questions. Well, which of these prospective clients are going to be the most likely candidates for positive behavior change? Which ones do we focus on? Which of these existing clients, you know, which of these briefs really points to positive behavior change? It affects our creative brief as well. Um, you know, is there anything in the kind of work that this client has asked for that isn't about positive behavior change? And if so, how can we evolve it? Because that's what we're doing now. Um, and so it's living, breathing, eating, sleeping, this uh, across every single potential touch point with every client, prospect, consultant, and employee and prospective employee, um, 100% of the way. So where do you see positive behavior change leading um, marketing as a whole? Uh, it, it's such an important thing. I mean, you talked about a lot of different categories where you know, people have never really thought about those as positive behavior changes. They, they're thinking, I've got to change my behavior. Um, there's a great book I read. Um, I cannot remember the author's name now, but it was Change or Die was the name of the book years ago. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how even though people are presented with this idea that they're going to, you know, they just had a massive heart attack or some other health related issue. And if they don't change, they're going to die within months or years. When we look at the culture around us and we see all of these opportunities from mental health to eating better, to locally sourcing food, where's your perspective of where this is going and, and where marketing itself is, is the rest of marketing going to follow, do you think, or will it just be a small uh, set of boutique agencies that really do this work? Yeah. So first of all, I don't think this is going to be niche. This is one of the challenges that we had when we were introducing the idea of 100% focus and positive behavior change to our internal audience, our own agency. Because obviously we in leadership and before I got back, you know, had been living with this, this idea for a long, long time. The immediate place that people spring to is that you're gonna work on not-for-profit only and, or that you're gonna work on sustainable products. And that's not the case. You know, this is about making a difference where you can across a multitude of different situations and categories. The way that I see it in my mind is it almost falls into three equal thirds. You've got, you know, the first tranche is definitely going to be those not for profit, you know, ad council type of, you know, executions and, and projects where you're genuinely making a difference in sustainability or addiction or health behaviors. Um, so the focus is going to be on those. And then in the second tranche, it's almost by default challenger brands, because challenger brands, if you think about it, have they've all always been about positive behavior change from the get go, typically, because they're challenging the conventional wisdom or the status quo within a category. And so they're coming up with an idea that's better. And so if it's better, it's about encouraging consumers and customers to do things in a way that's different and better. And so, again, by default, they're positive behavior change agents just because they exist. And so I see actually maybe a fat third of being those challenger brands. And then the final tranche I see being big corporations, big institutions, um, you know, like pharma companies, banking, where there is often an ESG or a, a component of, of those organizations where they focus on doing good in the world. And so that would be more about sustainability, more about helping feed the hungry, more about, um, you know, helping people with compliance issues is a major issue in, in the pharmacy industry. So are we going to, you know, take on huge big pharma accounts? Well, if they're willing to do positive behavior change work, then yes. But the likelihood is probably going to be a factor or a section of those companies where that's their primary focus that would be most appealing, um, you know, for, for them in us. Um, you know, it's basically being anywhere where, you know, change for the good can be made. You talked about change or die. You know, we have this chart that we use that I talk about in the book um, that is called the brand family chart, where we plot where we think a client is. And the, the, the quadrant that you don't want to be in is the dead dog quadrant, which is up in the, the far right. And those are brands that are kind of on the last breath. 
And typically they're going to be in their last breath because they didn't do something to help make them relevant in the era that we're living in. And so I won't go into who they are, but we all know who some of those brands are. And it's almost impossible to recover from being in, in that quadrant. There are a few notable exceptions, like Old Spice would be one of those exceptions. They did an amazing job pulling themselves out of that back into the alpha space. Um, but, you know, we would definitely work with clients that are in there that, that realize the only way for them to get out of that is to create positive behavior change. Um, you know, those would be brands that we'd love to pull back into the challenger space and, you know, and recognize that the only way out of this is to do something radically different that's radically relevant. Um, and radical relevance today means that you've got to go out there and show the consumer that you're culturally relevant and that you share their values and that you have strong values and you're purpose led and all the things that come with modern brands. Um, to answer your question about do I think that all marketers are going to point in this direction, I think that many of them will start to point in this direction. I think if this terrible 18 months has taught us anything, it's that we can't go back to the way things were professionally as companies and as individuals. Otherwise, what has it taught us? Um, and I think that, you know, coming out of, of this as hopefully we will into whatever the future is going to look like, we have to take some stuff with us. We have to remember about our priorities and remember what's important and remember that, you know, that, that there are some things that are just simply more important than anything else and, and not to leave those behind. Um, and I think that positive behavior change is going to be a really critical part of that, like learning to eat with family, um, learning that friends and family are the most important thing, learning to spend time with people, learning the touch and hugging and all those things that we couldn't do for the last 18 months are important. I mean, these are all positive behavior changes, learning to change our ways for the better. Um, that I think if companies come out of this not having learned that there's a place for positive behavior change within their organizations and certainly within their consumer bases and their prospective consumer bases, then I think they've got an issue. Um, so I think that we're not going to be short of opportunities and I, I put it that way. Um, so far, it seems to be working really well. Leslie, one of the things that Tony and I spend a lot of time talking about with podcast guests, we talked about this in our book, um, we have conversations about this, it seems like a lot, the, the shift between generations and mm -hmm. how much the generations now are demanding companies that are doing things for the greater good. So can you just touch on, on how that looks from your chair as co-CEO of Digo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it aligns obviously with positive behavior change. The minute we told our employees that this is what we were about and explained the, the kind of the, you know, the different types of businesses that we thought that we would appeal to, the energy and the excitement over the future of Digo was palpable. And as we've explained that to different consultants and different prospective clients and different um, prospective employees, that palpable kind of, you know, positivity has been there. Um, you know, I really believe in particular for Gen Zers, younger millennials to an extent, but definitely Gen Zers. So anyone around that 25 and under range, I think if you're not a company that is doing work for the better of humanity, and that extends to ad agencies, if you're not doing work for the better of humanity, they're just not going to be interested. That's where they want to but that's where they want to put their business in their lives. You know, that's where they want to basically be. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's really important for the future of our industry that we create a, not only an agency, but an industry that is ready for that generation because they're coming in right now. I mean, last two years, you know, unfortunately with COVID, but in the last two years, we've been pulling in interns and younger employees that are from that generation. It's what they want from their work life as well as from their personal lives. And the kind of brands that they want to work on, this is a generation that will say, I don't want to work on this if it doesn't feel right. It's kind of interesting for somebody of my age, you know, back in the day, you'd work on anything you were put on because that's how things were. But in your gut, you felt, I don't like this. I don't like what I'm doing on this. Now, you know, I think a lot of people would say, well, you can't really work in advertising and have a conscience because everybody works in stuff that they don't believe in. But we think that's changed. We really do, especially for a smaller independent. We're in the enviable position of being able to choose the kind of clients that we want to work with. And where those kind of clients 
are going to be attracted to us for all the right reasons. And that in turn is going to have a big impact on keeping our employees happy, especially those at the younger end of the scale and attracting, you know, modern talent, you know, into the, in, into the industry and the agency in the future. It's going to be a critical part of our industry moving forward. There's no question in my mind. I think it's so inspiring being somebody that's on the later part of our collective careers to, yeah. to see how they are standing up for that kind of thing. And, mm-hmm. and I know for me, I've learned a lot from, you know, I've got millennial children and employees, and it's just been really inspiring, I think, to change my paradigm when, you know, I've thought the same way you like, yeah, you do stuff you don't want to do because that's kind of the nature of it. But I, I think it's, it's a really fascinating time. And then you bolt on the stuff you were talking about in terms of COVID, what really matters. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's a really awesome time to be leading a business right now. Oh, it it is. I mean, I have three millennial children myself. And so I learn as much from them as, as they learn from, you know, their, their parents, um, but you know this this next generation they challenge you as well i mean they'll they'll it doesn't matter how senior you are they'll challenge you well hang on a minute why why do you think that's right or you know is this kind of business we should be going after they have no problem in putting it out there which i think is fantastic i think that you know we have to learn from each other you know we, we have to keep moving forward um and again, you know, I'm sure you've noticed the snapback in our industry has been extraordinary. I mean, when was the last time you saw help wanted signs? They're everywhere at the moment. And that includes in our industry. There's a lot of competition out there for talent. And so making sure that we're best positioned to attract the best talent that can serve our clients the best way moving forward with this new focus that we have is really important. And we're finding that it is attracting the right talent. Um, because it's, it shares their values is what they believe in. So Leslie, you've talked a lot about behavior change here and what Digo is doing in that realm. What kind of credentials does Digo have? Um, you know, I, I know it's not fly by night, but talk to me about what you brought to the table as an agency to really lead the charge here. Yeah. So there's a few things. So first of all, I mentioned before that Mark has been a student of positive behavior change for many, many years and has written extensively about positive behavior change. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of content out there. If anybody wants to catch up in it, just you know, have a look. There's some great stuff. Um, secondly, for myself, um, I trained many years ago as a psychotherapist. I took a break in advertising and, and went on to practice for a very short period of time, decided it wasn't for me, and then really brought all of that learning back to the industry, went back into the ad industry. Um, And so, you know, understanding not only the consumer, you know, attitudes and behaviors, but also their mindset has been a really important part of the way that I've been doing my work as a strategic planner. And so I'm bringing that to the fold. But I think very importantly, it's not enough for a bunch of ad people to do this. You know, we have developed and Mark certainly has developed over the years a panel of experts that we have tapped into and can tap into. Um, these are people in behavioral science, um, you know, psychologists, um, you know, people, clinical psychologists, people that are experts in behavior change um, that have really influenced how we're going to market, how we've positioned ourselves, the tools that we've developed and the tools that we will develop moving forward. They've been a very influential part of this and will continue to be so in the future. It's important that we have that external perspective. Um, so, you know, I think that because of all of this, it puts us in a really good position to own this, this territory, which I think is quite unique. What a fascinating thing you can bring to the table from where you thought you were going to go and then didn't. So, um, it, it fits. It's very cool. Leslie, Thank one of the you. things we like to do is give our chance, our, our guests on the show, a chance to talk about any nonprofit or a charity you support. So is there anybody we can give a shout out to? And then of course we'll put that information in our show notes. Yeah. So the the one that I want to, there's many, many, but the one I want to give a a shout out to is National Jewish Health. It's actually one of our clients. We've been working for them for quite some time. They're a not-for-profit hospital that's based out of Denver, um, Colorado, and they specialize in helping people breathe easier. And so specialize in, in all aspects of respiratory care and beyond. And they do extraordinary work that really helps people literally to breathe easier. Um, because there's such a prevalence of of asthmatic conditions and other breathing related conditions out there um, that, you know, they're the leading hospital in the nation. And again, they do extraordinary work. They're not for profit. So I'd love to give them a shout out. 
Thanks for that. And as, a, as an aside, I remember my young cousin having to move out to Denver when he was a child because of, of breathing issues. So that's, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. You're very Leslie, well. thank you can so I, much. I, oh, sure. also, I'm sorry. Can I just point out, well, they're also non-denomination. So despite the name, um, they're non-denomination. So oh, nice. you know, anyone can get treated there. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, Leslie, thank you so much. This has been just an incredible conversation. Really appreciate your time. Um, love what Digo's doing. Obviously, we know Mark DeMassimo, love him, have had him on the show. If you haven't had a chance to listen to his episode, please do. Um, But thanks again. Really appreciate it. Best of luck moving forward in your new role and with Digo, and uh, we'll be watching. All right. Thank you very much. Lovely to talk to you both. Thank you. Bye-bye. I absolutely love this interview with Leslie and listeners, as I told you, she's brilliant. Betsy said the same thing as we started off here. Um, I think the thing that really stands out to me is this whole idea of positive behavior change. And it's not just about stopping smoking or or helping with addiction. It's really looking at the industry and saying, what is it that this industry really needs? Where can it go? How can a new company challenge the old way of doing things and do things better? And it's also about, you know, as you as we dig into this, the Gen Z and the end of the millennial, you know, generation, if you will, and the fact that they live in a different way. They, they really consider the impact, long-term impact. They consider they want to work with companies and they want to, to use companies and brands that really care about things like the environment and about people and about you know, equal rights and all of these other types of things. So there's such a wide range of companies and brands that they can work with that are in the positive behavior change space. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I, I have seen, and I'm sure you have too, Tony, where companies are trying to be opportunistic with those generations and just like, oh, they, they care about this so we can make money off them this way. And when you talk to Leslie, it's so not that it's not about that. It's, it's so much, so much sincerity, I would say comes through in what they do. And then the part of the conversation that I really embraced was about how, Yes, they have it in their culture, but they have the discipline to say no to a client if they don't fit that culture. And they have the the ability to do that now. It's hard to do when it's hard to do anytime to say no to somebody who wants to pay you for your work. But but they have the discipline and the commitment to that culture of working with people who are sincere about the changes they want to make. So I, I just really loved it. Um, thanks for introducing us to Leslie, Tony, and that'll be a wrap for this episode. So thank you everyone for joining us again, and we'll see you next time on the Really Know Your Customer podcast. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Really Know Your Customer. We hope you gained a lot of value from being here today. If you want to learn more about the work Betsy and Tony do to help their clients thrive, Visit Betsy at thecongruitygroup.com and Tony at TonyBodo.com. See you next time on the Really Know Your Customer Show.